Welcome to Faith and Science. I'm Dr. John Ashton. It's interesting that when there are major disasters like, you know, building collapses or um, the big explosion in Beirut, Lebanon, or even the COVID-19 pandemic, people are happy to talk about um, prayer and, uh, you know, praying that they will, you know, find people still alive or recover them. Um, and as people are dying or suffering, uh, people are happy to talk about, um, you know, saying, and it almost seems like a cliche, you know, oh, we'll, you'll be remembered in our prayers. But the other thing I was uh, thinking about too as I watched one of the local television stations, I remembered when they used to have a, a program uh, on that or a little um, sort of add-on that signified now was the uh, end of the time when children should be watching and um, uh, and uh, and so they had the, some uh, little teddy bear, I think it was, going to bed. And I think at that earlier on, they used to have a little teddy bear who'd say a prayer or look at saying a prayer. And um hadn't seen for a long time, but I noticed that there's, there's no uh, prayer now. And also I noticed that, you know, this whole concept of, prayer outside the realm of coping with disasters and death uh, is something then that um, is looked at upon as well. You know, there's if there isn't any God, there's no point in praying, you know, and the, the all there is in the world is, is naturalism. In fact, in science, where it, scientists couldn't sort of really in terms of interpreting things in nature right up in a scientific paper that this is evidence of uh, of God's creation. Um, keeping God out of uh, of science seems to be something that is, you know, very, very strongly mandated. But in reality, if God created the, uh, the world and the earth, then as scientists we should be we should be looking um, uh, for the evidence in terms of the biblical worldview of a God who created it. Uh, matter of fact, I was um, listening to a conversation not so long ago where this person pointed out that you know there's a huge amount of money being spent on research to explore for extraterrestrial intelligence. That is, in some intelligence in outer space and that they have these radio telescopes that are listening to trying to pick up some signal that might be a, a code. And it's interesting that the uh, British uh, mathematician John Lennox, a professor of mathematics at Oxford University, one of the top universities in the world, and you know that uh, Professor Lennox, for example, has three doctorates, including the higher uh, DSC doctorate, Doctor of Science doctorate, and um, he, uh, you know, makes the, the point in, in one of his books that if we, re if scientists, these radio operators, scientists, astronomers, received a signal from outer space that was a code, like the DNA code, they would have no doubts that that was evidence for the existence of intelligence beings out in outer space. And yet we find this code, this amazing code in our cells, this amazing molecular code that describes all the structures of all the living things on this planet. And scientists don't read it that this is evidence of an intelligent design. And it just seems so ludicrous to continue to believe and to teach in our education system that this amazing genetic code that has to match the actual organism that it's in. So scientists believe these codes are raised by chance and has to match the organism that it's in and, and work. And I think we can, you know, just common sense says it's absolutely impossible. It doesn't happen. It can't happen. And then, of course, the code reader system, the ribosome that I've often talked about. But one of the fascinating things is when you think about the logic that if we received even a much more simpler code from outer space as some sort of radio blips or frequencies, 
that we would say that it was evidence of an intelligence outside in outer space. And that's what spending millions of dollars for manning these giant radio telescopes, listening for any possible signals coming from somewhere out in the universe. And yet right here under our noses, we've discovered this amazing code, but we can't recognise that it is powerful evidence for God. It's interesting that um, John Lennox, the brilliant uh, mathematician, writes in one of his recent books, Against the Flow, uh, on page 99, he writes that, I am only too aware that contemporary culture in the West is so dominated by the naturalistic worldview that anyone who claims that there is a supernatural dimension to reality is looked at askance, even mocked. And this, of course, this naturalistic worldview is that nature, this physical universe, is all there is. There's no, there's no God. That's this naturalistic worldview. And uh, he goes on to say, when I mentioned the resurrection in the culmination of my God delusion debate with Richard Dawkins in Alabama, Richard Dawkins responded in amazement at what he thought was my utter naivety. And this is what Richard Dawkins said. And I watched that debate on, um, uh, on the internet and I thought John Lennox performed so well. He was so much a gentleman. He had such brilliant arguments. They were such powerful arguments. I felt that Richard Dawkins really didn't have a leg to stand on in terms of arguments, in terms of any rational basis for um, his belief. And... Um, I, I think he, it was very clear that he had lost the debate. But then, as I said at the end, um, John Lennox spoke of his faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God and the literal resurrection of, of Jesus Christ. And, of course, Richard Dawkins took him to town. This is what he said. So, and this is what this is Richard Dawkins' words and reply in the debate to John Lennox. He said, so we come down to the resurrection of Jesus Christ it's so petty, it's so trivial, it's so local, it's so earthbound, it's so unworthy of the universe. And so we can see that this is, you know, this is Dawkins' view, but he didn't realise, he hasn't grasped the concept that Jesus was God. Jesus was the creator. And that's the big significance. That's the highly significant point. And that's why Jesus became alive again, even though... He was crucified on that cross, had a Roman spear put through him. He'd been whipped so many times beforehand and so forth. And we must remember, the Romans knew how to kill people. They were professionals. They did it all the time. They knew when people were dead. They knew how to make sure people were dead. Matter of fact, if they didn't make sure that people were dead and that was their job, they lost their lives. And so we know that Jesus was dead. And we also know for the number of witnesses afterwards that saw Jesus and testified that they saw Jesus and were prepared to die to testify that they saw Jesus, that this was a true account. And hence, of course, the, the rise of Christianity, but also the teachings of Jesus, of Jesus, what has been recorded about him and the way it's been recorded as such that we know if we analyse it, it couldn't have been contrived. And his teachings are just so profound too for someone in that culture that didn't have access to that sort of education that was, uh, you know, exclusive to more or less the priests and so forth at that time. And what John Lennox explains is that Richard Dawkins' view is that we have a simple choice. Either we believe in miracles and things like biblical prophecy, and of course we have overwhelming evidence that biblical prophecies came true. You know, the prophecies in Daniel, particularly Daniel chapter 2 and the prophecies later in the book of the timing of when Jesus would be born, they came true, you know, and to predict the world empires right through and that the Roman Empire would not be followed by another empire, would be followed just by a whole lot of states at that time. And that's what we found in, in Europe at that time. Even though there were many attempts to unite Europe, you know, from Charlemagne through to Napoleon through to Hitler and so forth. But they never succeeded. And um, 
And so he's saying that uh, that Richard Dawkins' view is that we have a simple choice. Either we believe in miracles and things like the biblical prophecy or we believe in the scientific understanding of the laws of nature, but not in both. For him, of course, the latter is by definition the only option for an intelligent person. And so what uh, you know, Dawkins is saying is that you know, a scientific understanding of the laws of, of nature is the only thing, but you can't believe in God as well. And, of course, that's ridiculous. And um, he goes on, Dawkins writes, The 19th century is the last time when it was possible for an educated person to admit to believing in miracles like the virgin birth without embarrassment. When pressed, many educated Christians today are too loyal to deny the virgin birth and the resurrection, but it embarrasses them because their rational minds know it's absurd, so they'd much rather be not asked. But, of course, that's absurd. He's, Dawkins isn't correct. And uh, John Lennox, uh, in, that the, in that there are many Christians that are scientists that believe in the literal resurrection of Jesus Christ and virgin birth. You know, I myself, for, for one, and I know many others that uh, believe that. And that's what Lennox goes on to point out, that Dawkins' statement is false. It's patently false and inexcusably false. There were many educated people in the 20th century and there are many educated people in the 21st century who wholeheartedly believe in the resurrection of Jesus without embarrassment. And John Lennox goes on to say, I am happy to be one of them. And the other thing that he points out is this, though. John Lennox points out, for, and to quote John Lennox, as he writes in his book, Against the Flow, and it certainly is a, a very thoughtful book, uh, Lennox writes, Furthermore, my rational mind tells me that for an educated person who values the scientific understanding of the universe, it is not the belief in the virgin birth and resurrection that is absurd. It is the atheistic worldview that is absurd because it negates the validity of the very rationality that we need in order to do science. And that's a very, very important uh, point. You see, the whole rationality of doing science is that there is a creator, that the universe is ordered, that the universe follows mathematical laws of an intelligent design. Otherwise, we can't, couldn't study it. If the universe is just random, there's no reason to do any experiment and expect that that is going to give us clues to the next experiment because everything is random. It's, um, and as he points out, the atheistic worldview is absurd because it negates the validity of the very rationality that we need in order to do science. Lennox goes on to say, Indeed, having debated with Richard Dawkins twice in public and discussed biblical miracles with him once in air and spent much time analysing his arguments, I find myself more than ever convinced of the truth of the resurrection of Jesus and the truth of biblical prophecy concerning him. The uh, veriferousness of the new atheist does not alter the fact, as Keith Ward points out in one of his books, that their vaunted naturalism is still a minority worldview, even amongst philosophers. And um, this is a very important point, that when we consider the philosophy of science, there is so much evidence for the need for a creator God behind what we observe, for a super intelligent mind behind what we observe. And the fact that our mind is created in such a way that we can understand and comprehend the universe to a degree. And this makes us, of course, very different to a lot of the other animals. When we... Um, Think about it, of course. Some atheists admit that, okay, science is in effect a child of Christianity, but they now claim that it's time science grew up and cut the apron strings. In other words, they're saying, well, hang on, you know, okay, there were, you know, earlier on, sure, the, you know, the most of the founders of modern science were Christians who believed in God and believed in creation. But hang on, we know more now.
But hang on, do we know more? When we consider it, and let's consider it, there's still no known mechanism how evolution, random mutations can produce meaningful new code to produce a new mining part. There's still no mechanism to do that because the codes to produce a functional new body part are so large and so complex. And secondly, that new body part has to be coordinated with all the other existing parts in order for it to work. And the codes to make those linkages with the other existing parts have to work. And for random processes to produce those codes, as we know, is absolutely impossible. Environmental factors can't produce new codes. Sunlight can't produce new codes. Changes of hot and cold, wet and dry, they can't produce new meaningful codes. You know, changes in epigenetics can affect the response of the DNA code because it is already pre-programmed to respond to those epigenetic changes or those changes in the environment that can switch on and off genes. That's because the code is already programmed to respond that way. But physical changes themselves can't reproduce new code. Sure, physical changes in the environment can switch on maybe dormant codes, can switch off codes, and so different effects take place. But they can't create new meaningful codes. And this is the whole point. You know, evolution relies on you know, environmental changes allowing survival of the fittest, but you've got to produce some new body part to enable it to survive in a better way in the first place, and random mutations can't do that. There's no known mechanism. So when scientists try to remove God, there's no known mechanism to explain the origin of life. There's no known mechanism to explain the origin of the first cell. There's no known mechanism to explain how the planets even could form in our solar system. There's no known mechanism to explain how the suns that we observe in the universe the planets that we observe can form. In fact, the universe itself, and I've talked about this um, occasions before, you know, we've got the horizon problem. The universe is 93 billion miles across, but only 13.8 billion years old, supposedly, according to their calculations. So how can it expand to, to be there faster than the speed of light? Fast, you know, how can matter move and, and distribute itself, energy distribute itself? Um, there's, there's just no known explanations. And, of course, they invoke dark energy to provide this extra rapid acceleration that the laws of physics were different originally. You know, duh, that's sort of, uh, hang on, we can't test that. How come you teach that to students? It's the whole creation scenario makes so much more sense. And this claim that it's time to cut the apron strings, of course, was spoken out quite clearly by none other than the former uh, United Kingdom Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. It was very interesting. She gave a talk uh, back in uh, May. The matter of fact, it was the 21st of May, 1988, um, to uh, the Church of Scotland General Assembly. And she titled it, uh, was in a, her speech was titled Christianity and Wealth. Um, and you can uh, look it up on the uh, internet. Um, actually, if you uh, go to uh, just Google Margaret Thatcher, or one word, dot org, um, and then forward slash speeches, and then forward slash display document, and... Um, uh, dot and it's uh, ASP um, question mark DOCID equals one zero seven two four six, and I'm sure if you Google it, you'd you'd find it as well. But this is one of the key things that she said in that speech, and this is what she said: I think back to many discussions in my early life when we all agree that if you try to take the fruits of Christianity without its roots, the fruits will wither and they will not come again unless you nurture the roots. But we must not profess the Christian faith and go to church simply because we want social reforms and benefits or a better standard of behaviour, but because we accept the sanctity of life 
the responsibility that comes with freedom and the supreme sacrifice of Christ expressed so well in the hymn, When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. Now, of course, we know that Margaret Thatcher was a, was a chemist, but she points out a very, very important thing, that as saints, they, even th- atheists admit, Christianity and Christian faith in a creator God underpins the development of modern science. To throw that away just leads us into a whole lot of spurious errors. And I think that's exactly what has happened with the teaching of the theory of evolution and um, the consequences that that has had that people now feel, some people now feel so confident, well, we can throw away the Ten Commandments. We don't have to worry about uh, Christian morality, all these sort of things. In many ways, and, um, you know, this came up in a recent conversation too, that, you know, believing in evolution is similar to, to Baal worship. And again, there was the... The, you know, the moral decline associated with Baal worship that is associated with the uh, belief in evolutionary theory as well. And we can see, you know, I, I think that, you know, there are very strong cases that can be argued for the changes in politics, in um, secular morality and so forth that have occurred as a result of imbibing um the evolutionary theory of discarding Christian morals and the result that we see in terms of the breakdown of the Christian marriage um, and the pain of divorce and the effect that that has on the younger generations um, and their reactions to, um, you know, respecting life and, um, and uh, you know, and, and social behaviour and, and so forth. And, you know, there, there's so much evidence, I think, if we look um, and believe, uh, if we study science and we believe in a creator, we're going to make so many more um, discoveries, advantages. You know, I, one article that uh, I came across too uh, not so long ago was, uh, for example, that Charles Darwin was in, intrigued by the toucan's monstrous beak. Now, of course, the toucan is is one of these uh, birds, the uh, toco toucan or uh, ramasastos toco, um, which is the largest uh, member of the toucan family, has the largest beak relevant to its body size of all birds. And uh, there's a little bit of naked skin around the eyes too that is also part of the beak. And of course, it's, it's brilliantly coloured. But um, he, Darwin actually wrote about this bird and he said toucans may owe their enormous size of their beak to sexual selection for the sake of displaying the diversified and vivid stripes of colour which these organs are ornamented. In other words, um, Darwin was suggesting that the big beaks attract mates. Um, and, of course, others have suggested that the beaks are for peeling uh, fruit or warning off territorial w- w- rivals or visual warnings to predators. However, again, if we look and we think, hang on, the God created this. Why did, why did he create the beak? Um, these birds, of course, live in the tropics where it's quite uh, hot, and this is what science have discovered. New research has identified that a key function of the toucan's bill is to help the toucan keep cool in tropical climates or when expending a lot of energy while flying. And uh, the article I was reading was saying, just as elephants flush their large ears with blood to let heat dissipate into the air and and thus keep their core temperature stable, so the toucan uses its massive beak to radiate heat away. And it's interesting that all warm-bodied animals need to release excess body heat and they have different mechanisms to do this. And these all point to design. As David Catchpole, a a PhD-qualified plant physiologist, uh, points out, it's a very interesting article he wrote on toucans. And um, it's interesting that the toucan's beak 
meets the requirements of being a thermal radiator perfectly. Um, so it actually makes up sometimes up to 50% of the toucan's overall body surface area and it has an extensive network of blood vessels close to the surface. And it's not a simple passive thermal radiator as the heat exchange properties are actually carefully re regulated. And um, it's interesting, they've done a lot of study of this now and using infrared photography, which displays the, the warm areas as uh, bright and cool areas as dark, research observed that the toucan can adjust blood flow to its beak and um, thereby help regulate the temperature. And um, so in the hot conditions, they flood a lot of blood into their beak and, of course, colder they um, have a lot less um, conditions. Um, but again, how can Darwin explain this? Could ideas of natural selection have accounted for how a toucan's bill could have endo become endowed with such crucial and sophisticated functions with all its separate blood vessel networks supplying the, both the distal and proximal regions of the beak? And um, the amazing heat exchange properties of the Ducan speak when they think, oh, well, it was, you know, for mating and, and so forth. But all these discoveries, as I said, that scientists are making point to intelligent design and a creator. Of course, there are many scientists that believe in a, a literal creation and, and um, that's why some years ago I put out the book In Six Days, Why 50 Scientists Choose to Believe in Creation. And each of these scientists... Um, describe in their chapter why they personally choose to believe in creation. They all hold doctorates um, and from around the world. And, of course, that uh, book is uh, you know, still available on online booksellers and also it can be downloaded free on the creation.com website. So just go to creation.com and in the search engine there, enter in six days and uh, the book will come up on one of the first uh, options that come up. Down the left-hand side there'll be of the page will be a list of names of scientists. Click on each name and they'll come up the reason uh, for why they choose to believe in, in creation. And, of course, there's my book, Evolution Impossible too, um, which um, I'm very pleased to say has uh, just been reprinted again now, so now is widely available again. You've been listening to Faith and Science, and if you want to re-listen to these uh, programs, remember you to Google 3ABN Australia, or one word, .org, .au, and click on the listen button. I'm Dr. John Ashton. Have a great day. You've been listening to a production of 3ABN Australia Radio. 